Hello, stream. Hello. So we are just about to start a new series. And this might be a quite a long series as we'll be starting reading from this book, A Manual of Insight by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And so I just prepared a few tools uh, beyond this book and it's really just one thing and it's just the map I want to show before we really get into reading aloud it's this map from the Diga Nikaya and uh, as we all know the Diga Nikaya contains some very beautiful illustrations and this is the Diga Nikaya Check out this map. I thought maybe by seeing this map, hold on. So how could I best show this? So, um, is this actually hard to show you? Maybe it is. The lighting is a little bit off. So don't focus on the content over here. Just try and get a feel for the map. So the map here is India at the time of the Buddha. And I thought it might help us to uh, get into the mood of um, when the Buddha's venerable arahants were around. So as you can see, the Sakyas and Kusinara and Kosambi and Gaya, just around there. And the Himalaya mountain range. And at the bottom there you can see Sri Lanka. So I just thought that this could be a great tool to kind of uh, put our minds into the right mood or setting for receiving the Dhamma. And so that was the one thing I wanted to show before we actually begin. Um, and let me just take this one out. So this is a, a foreword. It comes with the book, so I'm just going to put it over here since it might just fall out as we start to open the book up here. But all the way in the back of this book, you're going to find this an appendix Manual of Insight by Mahasi Sayada. And this actually folds out pretty large, so. I also thought this was a very, very cool thing that comes with the book. So now you can see I'm disappearing behind it. But here it is. It's, it's, it has all different kinds of things. So at the back side here, we have uh, a, an appendix on uprooting the defilements. And all kinds of different things, material materiality and um, mental processes and planes of existence that might be uh, interesting to just show here which is on the back side I don't, I'm not sure I'm doing this quite right but so you saw the other side here the front so let me just show you the back side as well so as you can see it's quite an extensive uh, tool and it should also, yeah, the progress of insight. So here we have all the different stages of insight, which might not be the most beneficial to actually mention right now in further detail than just kind of saying that they're here. So the first three progresses of insight are the purification of conduct, Sila Visuddhi and the purification of mind, Chitta Visuddhi, purification of view, Ditti Visuddhi. And the first knowledge is knowledge that discerns mental and physical phenomena. So that would be the Nama Rupa realization, also known as Nama Ruta, Nama Rupa. Parichetanya. 
and the purification by overcoming doubt. Kanka we Kanka Vitarana Visuti. Kanka Vitarana Visuti. Anyway, I thought that would be interesting to mention as something uh to kind of yeah, put our minds into the right mood. So we have a few tools. So that's kind of uh a great overview of all the different things. So I just received this book today, Manual of Insight by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And I thought I would do uh, some reading aloud from it. I probably won't be doing any uh, explanation of things because as you're going to see, um, this book is going to probably explain to you in more details and more relevant details than I would anyways but if there's something I feel like I should kind of add maybe something from that has benefited me for example I can start off by saying that uh, the Buddha's teaching has benefited me greatly and um, as presented by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw um, presenting the Buddha's teachings that is also something that I have benefited greatly from. So that's why I thought I might uh, spend some time and energy on mm, sharing some of the things or the teachings of the Buddha as presented by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And as I could just read here, it is translated by the Vipassana Metta Foundation. Translation Committee. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to read the introductions and the four words. You should order the book if you want to uh, get uh, your hands on it, as it were. So let's just read this intro. I think this is a good starting point. Obviously giving paying homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Homage to the blessed one, the worthy one and the rightly self awakened one. So that translation doesn't actually it isn't actually found here, but praise to uh, the Triple Gym is, and it goes like this. Without equal is the omniscient Buddha of nine attributes. Without equal is the Dhamma of six attributes. Without equal is the Sangha of nine attributes. And I hope my mic set up here is all right, so it doesn't actually uh, get caught by the breath of my voice. Let me just see if I can test that. It's like it's pretty all right. Um, yeah, I'm going to obviously check that after the stream, but I don't think I have any viewers right now to help me out on that point. Anyways, let's continue on here. So, as I just said, um, the three lines here, without equal is the omniscient Buddha of nine attributes, without equal is the Dhamma of six attributes, and without equal is the Sangha of nine attributes. Maybe we should see if we can just quickly get into the footnotes I bet we're probably going to find some interesting ones Ok, 
Okay, here we go. Lots of footnotes. It should be fairly easy to find them as they are number one, two, and three. But it might be too big of a job for me, anyways. Maybe it's just a reference, actually, to... Just a second stream. I don't want to rush uh, the study or anything. It would actually be nice to, for me to understand the setup of the footnotes. I'm big on reading notes. I find they explain things. Okay, here we are. So I was just on the wrong page. So the first footnote about the nine attributes of the Buddha. And here is the translation of uh, the homage. It goes like this. Homage to the blessed one, the perfect one, the, the fully enlightened one. And on the nine attributes of the Buddha, the Blessed One, Bhagawa, is accomplished. Bhagawa is accomplished. Arahang, fully enlightened, Sama Sambudo, three. Perfect in true knowledge and conduct. Vicha Charanang Sampa. Vicha Charanang. Vicha Charana Sampano. Sublime, Sukato. Noah of Worlds, Loka Vito, Incomparable Leader of Persons to be Tamed, Anuttaro Purisatamma Sarati, Teacher of Gods and Humans, Satta Deva Manu Sanang, Enlightened Uto, and number nine. The Blessed Bhagwa and the Dhamma's six attributes. The Dhamma is one well proclaimed by the Blessed One, Sawaka Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo is visible here and now, Sanditiko, immediately effective, Akaliko. Inviting inspection, ehi pasiko, onward leading, opanayiko. And number six, to be experienced by the wise for themselves, pachatang veditabo nyuhiti. And the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples, one, practices the good way, supatipano. Bhagavato Sawakasanko and two practices the straight way Uchu Patipano and three practices the true way Naya Patipano and four practices the proper way Samichi Patipano are four pairs of persons Chitari Puriyasa Puriyasa Ugani The eight types of individuals Atta Puri Atta Purisa Pukala who are five number five worthy of gifts and number six worthy of hospitality 
worthy of gifts. Ahuneyo, and worthy of hospitality. Pahuneyo. And number seven, out of nine, worthy of offerings. Takin. Takinheyo. And eight, worthy of reverential salutation. And jali karanyo. And our number nine, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. The infinite field. It doesn't say that, but it's kind of the same thing. Anuttarang unya kitang lokasa loka. Well. Okay, so those were the nine and six and nine attributes of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. When we reflect in this way, might the mind becomes particularly clear and delighted. At that moment, we observe the mental states of reflection, clarity, and delight, as well as physical phenomena that depend on these mental states as they arise. May virtuous people who practice as instructed in this book attain path, fruition, and Nibbana in this very life. So, that is a key um, point also as to why I have chosen to start this study. Because it seems that some people today say that no one can become enlightened anymore or there are no Arahants or there are no Aryas, enlightened beings in the world today. And even though we are 2600 years late in terms of uh, being around the Buddha when he was alive and the Arahants of the Buddha, uh, his disciples, chief disciples like Sariputta and Mok, Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Mahamokalana. Even though we are so late, many thousands of years, um, the Buddha Sasana, the teachings of the Buddha, is still around. So that means there are still enlightened beings around. So let me just read again here. May virtuous people who practice, as instructed in this book, attain path, makkha, pali, fruition, pala, and nibbana in this very life. Thus have I composed this manual on the practice of insight meditation, onward leading to nibbana. Okay, so let's just go. On all of these prefaces, translators, introductions. And here we are. So I'm thinking that I should actually uh, not put the book down and read with my head down. I think I should do as I always do. Lift the book up and hold it like this. Uh, I'm just looking at the screen here to kind of get an idea about how... I mean, it just looks very not good to be with my head down. So I think it would be uh, very good to hold the book up and kind of show that dedication of energy as well. And, yeah, so as we're clear on the setup, I think we should continue on and get right into it. So here we have the introduction, not the translator's introduction or anything but the introduction to the book. So now we will begin. According to the Buddhist teaching, the practice of 
Insight meditation, vipassana, enables one to realize the ultimate nature of mind and body, to see their common characteristics of impermanence, anicca, suffering, dukkha, and not-self, anatta, and to realize the Four Noble Truths. To reject the practice of insight meditation is to reject the teachings of the Buddha, to undermine others' faith and confidence in the practice, and to abandon the prospect of attaining the path and fruition. The following verse from the Dhammapada shows how big an offense this is. As follows, the unwise who rely on evil views to malign the teachings of the noble Arahants who live the Dhamma produce fruit that destroys themselves, like the Kataka reed that dies upon bearing fruit. I should really have a kind of a bookmark to my footnotes. I always have that. A bookmark to my footnotes. Oh, so here we have the Pali of uh, the verse I just read. The Dhammapada. Yo sasanang arahatang ariyanang Dhamma avichanang patiko sati dumeto titing nisaya papikang palani kata kasewa atta atta ka Taya Palati. So these are very, very small uh, letters. But what it, I just read says The unwise who rely on evil views to malign the teachings of the noble Arahants who live, by, who live the Dhamma produce fruit that destroys themselves, like the Kataka reed that dies upon bearing fruit. This is uh, very, very good. So I hope we can use this here as our little bookmark, even though it is kind of big. So what is this? It is four words. So I, I don't think it does much damage to just fold this over making it a little bit smaller and now we have a bookmark should I read like this or kind of like this from the side probably better to face the camera like this the following reflections can arouse enthusiasm for the practice of insight meditation. Access to the Dhamma is a precious opportunity. We are very fortunate to be alive at this point in history when we have access, access to the teachings of the Buddha. It is a tremendous opportunity for all of us. We have the chance to profit by realizing the path, makkha, fruition, pala, and Nibbana that are the most valuable Dhammas. But this opportunity will pass. Unfortunately, this great opportunity does not last forever. The span of our lives ends before long. Even if our lifespans are not yet over, we can die at any time. And even while we're still alive, we might we may lose the ability to practice if we become weak or sick due to old age, if conditions are too dangerous, or if other problems or difficulties arise. We should not waste our time. 
How should we make best use of this great opportunity? After having read this book, should we be satisfied just with our academic learning of teachings? Should we continue to devote all of our time and energy to, to the pursuit of never-ending sense pleasures? Is it not better to practice so that we will not find ourselves helpless on our deathbeds without any reliable spiritual achievement to support us? The Buddha reminded us constantly that we have to practice effectively before, beforehand as long as there is time. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come. Who knows? No one knows when they are going to die. No bargain with morality can keep him and his hordes away. Oh, I'm sorry, no bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. Ajewa Kichamata Kichamatapang Ko Chanya Maranang Sawe Suwe These are really small letters. Maybe I, I should check if I need glasses or something. Regret is useless. If we do not practice, although we have the opportunity, we will feel regret when we are sick, old and weak, lying in our deathbed, or being reborn in the lower realms before it's too late Keep in mind the Buddha's admonition. Meditate because do not delay or else you will regret, regret later. This is our instruction to you. I think we should always read the Pali. So let me just get it up so I can see the letters. Jayata Pikawe Ma Pamatatana Ma Pacha we pass we Ahu Wata. Okay, let me just see if I can find a B because that's a B and that's a, an H. Very well. Do you have personal experience? Are you able to appreciate the attributes of the Dhamma from personal experience? Do you know its attributes for yourself? Do you know that it is well explained by the Buddha? That it is empirically experienced? That it gives immediate results? That it invites one to come and see, to realize the truth for oneself? How to read this book. Please keep in mind the following considerations as you read this book. Don't read carelessly. It is very important to read the whole book thoroughly and carefully from the beginning to end to the end in order to appreciate the author's meaning and examples taken from the Pali texts, the commentaries and sub-commentaries. Don't feel disheartened if you come across Pali references that you don't understand. They are mentioned here primarily for serious scholars of Pali. If you wish to understand, you may ask such scholars and obtain the meaning. Some of the Pali, f some of the Pali found in the book is not translated. Again, it is included primarily for the benefit of serious scholars of Pali. English translation of Pali references from the Discourse on the Foundation of Mindfulness, Satipatthana Sutta, are widely available. In some places the book 
everyday language is used rather than formal language. The Buddha himself used Makkadi, the everyday language of his time, when he gave Dhamma talks rather than classical Sanskrit. This should not be considered odd or a sign of the relative insignificance of the material. Those with little or no knowledge of the Pali scriptures should concentrate on chapters 4 and 5. Even reading and studying only chapter 5 will enable you to practice inside meditation in a straightforward way and you will be able to realize path knowledge, fruition knowledge and Nibbana knowledge. Maybe I should just before we really get into it, I should bring up my little dictionary here. Knowledge. So I think Abhinya would be a good translation for knowledge. Maka Abhinya. I wonder if that is a Pali word. Maka Abhinya. No, it's probably not created as such. Anyway, we're definitely ready to Okay, let me just share the stream. Is this the link? I hope that was the right link. Okay. So that was the introduction. Makkha, Abhinya, Pala Abhinya and Nibbana. Finally, don't feel disheartened if you have not yet attained a satisfactory level in your meditation practice. Go to a teacher and, pra and practice systematically. Systematically under his or her guidance for seven days, fifteen days, or one month according to the instructions given in this book. You will experience, your experience will be satisfactory and you will realize special insights. You will also realize for yourself that the Dhamma is endowed with the aforementioned attributes. So the language of the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw is, as we just read it, purification of conduct. So that was, uh, we just went through the introductions. Oops. And now we get into the actual book, Manual of Insight. Purification of Conduct for Monks According to the Visuddhimakkha, purification of conduct, Sila Visuddhi, refers to the four kinds of morality, Sila, which is the Pali word for morality, that are completely purified. 
moral purity is indeed completely cleansed through observing the monastic rules beginning with the fourfold morality. Sila Visuddhi Nama Suparisuttang Patimoka Patimok Samwarati Samwari Samwari Samwara Tichatu Pitang Silang An incredibly long word. Purification of conduct refers to the purification of four kinds of morality that I will fully explain in this section. The morality of observing the monastic precepts, patimoka samwara. Pati yeah. The morality of pursuing a pure livelihood, adiwa parisutti. The morality of wisely using requisites, pachaya. Sunny Satita Pachaya Sunny Sat Sunny Sat Sunny Sita and carefully restraining the senses Intria Samwara. These are two categories of morality one for monks and one for lay people. Since the morality of monks is quite extensive, I will explain it only in summary. As a monk, one should fully and as a monk, one should fully purify the four types of morality. Observing mon the monastic precepts. Observing the monastic precepts that were established by the Buddha to restrain one's actions of body and speech from transgression is called the morality of observing the monastic precepts. This kind of morality protects one from numerous kinds of dangers and suffering. The guideline given to fully purify this morality is seeing the danger in the slightest faults, observing the commitments he has taken on. A monk should take great care not to break any of his precepts. He should consider even minor offenses to be dangerous, since they can interfere with his, with his prospect of attaining the path and fruition and lead him to a rebirth in the lower realms. So we have to understand that even a monk, someone who has ordained and entered the order of the monks, is not necessarily yet enlightened, as he still has to go through the training. So, um, for a monk who has undertaken the rules, the training rules, to break the precepts, it is actually far more, um, there's much more grave consequences for a monk to break the rules than for a lay person to not be able to uphold the rules. And for someone who is enlightened, there would be no real uh, trouble in keeping the rules since it's just their nature as when you become enlightened your whole nature changes so these rules for monks and lay people they're really in place to kind of emulate someone who is enlightened as the Buddha actually didn't actually he, he didn't have any rules uh, to guide him to 
become enlightened because before the Buddha became enlightened, there were no enlightened beings in the world. So the rules came about afterwards as uh, monks kind of uh, acted in bad uh, manners. and So the Buddha had to instate some rules and guidelines for all the monks. So, so, so the order would uh, be respectable and not break any rules. So that's very common, you know, um, for people to think that rules can make you enlightened, but that's not so. You know, rules cannot make you enlightened. They're just more like a fence. Uh, in which you should try and stay and not jump over the fence. For someone who is enlightened, they don't really need a fence because no matter where they go, they see uh, no dangers. So, just a few comments on rules. So, and that was related to m the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw saying that even monks could uh, go to a bad rebirth, but someone who actually is enlightened, they can never come to a bad rebirth. That would be impossible. And also it would be impossible for someone who is enlightened to kill their own mother, their own father, or to cause a schism in the Sangha, or to cause a Buddha to bleed uh, with intent to causing harm to him. So it could be that, um, for example, if there was a even let's let's just say if there was a private Buddha and he had a disciple or someone near to him who was enlightened and maybe he had some kind of a sickness. So if for example he had a a parasite, so maybe that monk or the disciple could remove the parasite and cause the Chibuddha to bleed from just removing, like for example, a parasite, that would not be count as causing a Buddha to bleed, because it is described as with evil intention to then cause a Buddha to to, uh, to bleed, to cause a, a Buddha to bleed. So that would be uh, that's totally different. And um, that just goes to show how important intentions are in as an ex aspect of what forms your reality, even your future, future births. So yeah, let's continue. If a monk happens to break a precept, he should correct it as soon as possible just as a child would immediately drop a red-hot charcoal that he had accidentally picked up. A monk expiates his offense by observing, by observing probation, pariwatta and penance, manatta, of ostracism, or by relinquishing any money or materials according to the procedure given in the scripture. So there's uh, a very detailed procedure of taking care of monks who um, come to break rules in the Vinaya. Once an offense is restored in accordance with the rules for monks, the Vinaya, the monk should determine not to commit such an offense again. In this way, he fully purifies uh, he fully purifies observation of the monastic precepts. So monks, they have 220 rules. And it's very hard to keep them all. So if a monk were to break one of these rules, he should immediately um, admit it to another monk or a gathering of monks. Pursuing a pure livelihood. Seeking or receiving the four requisites. 
The four requisites, number 13. Okay, so the vineyard actually has 227 roles for big quiz. Male monks. And the requisites, the four requisites are food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. Seeking or receiving the four requisites in accordance with the rules for monks is called the morality of pursuing pure livelihood. The most important aspect of this kind of morality is making the effort to obtain the four requisites in a way that are, are in accord with the rules for monks. There are many ways of obtaining requisites that are not in accord with the rules for monks. A, com a comprehensive list of these can be found in the Visuddhimagga. If a monk obtains any of the four requisites by violating the rules for monks, the offense is called offenses meriting expulsion, parajika. Parajika. Number 14. These are four grave offenses that immediately disqualify a person from remaining a bhikkhu or a nun or becoming a bhikkhu or a nun again in this life. Taking a human life, these are the four. Taking a human life, stealing, engaging in sexual intercourse, or misrepresenting one's spiritual attainments. So, for example, yeah, let's not go into that. Offenses requiring a convenient, a convening of the sangha, sangha, disesa, serious infractions, tula chat, tula chaya, tula chaya, or improper conduct, dukkata, depending on what kind of action he has committed. Improper conduct is the most common offense. The use of requisites that one has improperly acquired is also improper conduct. So that also goes for lay people. So for example, if you make money by selling uh, living beings such as humans or uh, trafficking humans or if you steal things and sell them, that is a uh, wrong livelihood. and no one who does that can ever become enlightened because of the effect such deed has on the mind. But if you are a lay person who earns money, let's say by hard labor, or maybe you help build houses, or maybe you work some kind of a factory job, or maybe you are a librarian, um, and you're making your money, uh, where your livelihood, maintaining your livelihood in one of these ways, uh, that would not actually inhibit you from attaining Nibbana or enlightenment. It would actually help you since your livelihood is pure. It would remove some very real dangers on the path. So that's uh, just a few comments on layperson's rules. Yeah, the use of uh, requisites that one has improperly acquired is also improper conduct. The observation of mas monastic precepts is also broken when one commits these offenses. This can damage the monk's prospect of celestial rebirth, path knowledge and path fruition. And fruition knowledge, excuse me. When these offenses are restored by way of aforementioned procedures, the observation of monastic precepts can again be purified and one escapes from these dangers. So a monk must thoroughly purify this type of morality too. Wisely using requisites. So the Buddhist teaching or the training 
consists of three things. Morality, concentration, study, concentration, and wisdom. The insights gained from the meditation practice. These are the three mm, duties we have. And I should put out more energy and not kind of lean back here, I think. Wisely using requisites. The morality of wisely using requisites refers to keeping in mind the, pu the purpose for using the four requisites. To keep this morality pure, to keep this morality purely, every time a monk uses any of the four requisites, he should consider its proper purpose. For example, when a monk wears or changes his robe, he should consider that the purpose of the robe is to simply protect him from the elements, not to make his body beautiful or attractive. When he eats, he should consider the purpose of the food. One morsel after another. If he cannot do so at the moment of eating, he can do it sometime before the next dawn. If he fails to do so until the dawn breaks, it implies that he uses the requisites on loan. Inya Pariboka as explained by the commentaries. The term, use, the term use of requisites on loan does not mean that the monk is accountable to repay his supporters for their donation in a future rebirth. It is given this name because the way that the monk utilizes the requisites resembles the way that someone procures th something on loan. This is explained as follows. By donating requisites to a monk of pure morality, lay supporters fulfill one of the factors of, per of perfect donation. Thus, they receive the greatest benefits possible for their generosity. If a, monk, if a monk fails to consider the proper purpose in using the requisites, it, his keeping in mind the purpose for using the four requisites is not pure, and the donors cannot enjoy the full benefits of their donations. For this reason, donors are then compared to someone who has sold something on loan credit. They have not received the full value for their donation. The recipient monk is similarly com compared to someone who purchases on loan or on credit without giving the full value. So another thing that uh, severely hinders your possibility for real progress or even from just becoming a monk uh, not even becoming a woman, but you know, for taking up uh, the robes is if you have debt, uh, unpaid debt. I believe if you are indebted, you cannot become a monk. Or if you owe time, for example, if you're you owe the state time in terms of you have to go to prison, you can't just run off and join the sangha. Uh, that is impossible. So, it is good for Buddhists to seek to be debt-free, even to the extent of living uh, in relative uh, modesty. That would be preferable to being indebted uh, left and right. The Mahatika says Inya in Inga Inka Pariboka means use of something on loan. 
Mahatika number 15. The Visudima, the Visudimaka Mahatika attributed to the Mapala. Okay. The Mahatika, the great Tika. A donation is compared to the use of something on loan since the recipient of it is not qualified for the factor of perfection of perfect donation but the Mahatika also says just as a debtor cannot go where he wishes so also the monk who uses things on loan cannot go out of the world So we have two Pali So the last one I just read here in Pali Yata Inka Yat Yata Inga Yiko Atano Ruchiya Ichita Desang Kantum Kantum na lapati Ewang inga paripo kaya paripo kayuto lokato nis nisarito na lapati. So those are the Pali words. So what is the point of this passage then? The point is that if a monk uses requisites without considering the purpose for doing so, his attachment to them is not cut. The attachment will lead him to the, low w to the lower world after his demise. The story of a monk named Tisa illustrates this. A bhikkhu by the name Tisa died with feelings of attachment to his brand new robe and was reborn as a louse on that very robe. When the robe was about to be, sh uh, about to be shared among the other bhikkhus, according to the rules for bhikkhus regarding a dead bhikkhu's possessions, the louse cried and accused the bhikkhus of robbing him of the robe. Although his physical power, his psychic power. Oh, let, sorry. Let me just read that again. Through his psychic power, the Buddha heard the Laos crying and asked the bhikkhus to postpone sharing the robe, lest the Laos should be reborn in a hell realm. Okay, so this is a, a reference to the cosmology of hell. A week later, the Laos died and was reborn in Tusita, the celestial realm. Only then did the Buddha allow the robe to be shared among the bhikkhus, as explained in the commentary of the Dhammapada. This seems to be like a classic story. Uh, depicting attachment. This is a frightening thing. In view of his rebirth in the Tusita celestial realm, right after his Laos, his Laos's death, it is clear that if he had not been attached to his robe, he would have been reborn in that celestial realm immediately after his monk's death, after he died as a monk. Moreover, if the Buddha had not postponed the sharing of his robe, he might even have been reborn in hell. Attachment is a serious misdeed and a frightening thing. The Buddha delivered the following verse regarding this event. As rust corrupts the very iron that, has that formed it, so transgressions lead the doer to states of bow. And the Pali, I'm sure. The Dhammapada, number 63. 
Ayasawa Malam Samuti Tang Tatutaya Tamewa Katati Ewang Ati Ati Dona Jari Nang Sani Kamas Kamani Nayanti Dukating Some people assume that due to the use of materials on loan, a monk cannot attain path and fruition, and he is accountable to repay his loan. However, such an assumption is not in accord with the texts at all. Some say that the use of materials on loan is a more serious offense than both enjoying the status of a monk on false pretense and the four offenses meriting expulsion. This is so because when someone who has become a lay this is so because when someone has become a lay person or a novice after committing an offence meriting expulsion of the of the offence of enjoying the status of a monk on false pretenses, that person can attain path and fruition. For the Pali reference, there is a passage from the Anguttara Nikaya commentary. So if you just want to become a monk to... Mm, let's say if you're like a very very poor person who lives on the street and you don't get ever get any food. And then you think to yourself, but if I become a monk, I can get food every day. But I... I won't practice the teachings or meditation at all. I will just eat and eat and eat and enjoy being a monk. Apparently, this can lead to expulsion. From an Abhidhamma point of view, obviously, that is a great benefit uh, coming from uh, being very, very destined and poor and never eating to getting some food at least so you can say that the person has kind of done something in accordance with their own understanding in attaining food but they have not yet understood the benefit of becoming a monk so they think to themselves I should not train and I should not keep the rules I should just lean back and enjoy the monk's life so that's wrong view and Anyone who is not enlightened has wrong view. So that can be fixed. After listening to this after listening to this discourse which discourse? Aki Kando Pama Sutta Anguttarenikaya. Maybe we could look that up later. After listening to this discourse, 60 bhikkhus who had committed grave offenses were seized by spiritual urgency, some vega, and relinquished their bhikkhuhood. They then lived as novices, some manera, fulfilling the ten novice precepts. Later, cultivating good mental attitudes, some of them became stream enterers, sut suttapana. Uh, what does it actually say in the footnotes about Suttapana? One who has attained the first stage, path and fruition of enlightenment, and then we, have co we go to the second and third, which are as follows. Some once returners, Sakadagami, some non returners, Anagami, the third stage, and some were reborn in the celestial realm. Thus, even bhikkhus who commit offenses, meriting expulsion, could be rewarded. Number 24. And then we have the Pali here. Imang Panna Desanang Sutva Jata Samvega Tanang Jahita. Jahitwa 
สัมมาเนระปุมิยังทิตตาสะสิลานิภูริทวะโยเนโสมานาสิการะยุทธาพายุทธายุทธาพายุทธาเคจูสุตตปานิสุตตปานะเคเจสักกะดกามีโนเคเจอานากามีโนอเฮสุนเคเจเทวาโลกะสมบูรณ์ในเทวารัมส์บลัชจอนรัมส์เอวังพาราจิกะพัญญานัมพีสหัปปาลาสัพพาลาอาภูสิ I actually think I am getting some real Pali lectures here. Thus, even bhikkhus who commit offenses meriting expulsion could be rewarded. Reward. This is the last one there. e w a n g Parichika Panya. No, no, no. e w a n g Parichika Panna Nampi. Sapala Ahusi. Sapala. Okay. The commentary explains that the Buddha. Had seen those six monks committing offenses meriting expulsion, so he made his journey with the purpose of delivering this discourse to them on the way. It is clear from this explanation that they had led their lives as monks on false pretenses for some time after committing grave offenses. Even so, their grave offense and of A grave offense, an offense of enjoying the status of a monk on false pretenses. So that's two offenses. Did not destroy their prospects for path knowledge and fruition knowledge. So how is it possible that using the requisites on loan, a minor offense, could destroy the prospects of enlightenment of a monk, regardless of his otherwise good observation of monastic precepts? That is not reasonable at all. A point well made. The monastic code and wisely using requisites. The instruction to consider the purpose for using the four requisites is not from the rules from from the rules for monks, but from the discourses. So a failure to consider the purpose for using the four requisites does not mean that a monk violates any monastic rule laid down by the Buddha. So it cannot cause any damage to the monk's prospect of path knowledge and fruition knowledge. Thus, we should not say that the use of requisites on loan is even as serious as the offense of improper conduct, which is. The, le the least serious offense of the monastic rules, aside from improper conver conversation, d u p a s i t a One may ask here: the commentary says that taking medicine without considering the purpose for doing so constitutes a breach of the monastic rules. So it is not reasonable to assume that not keeping the The purpose for using the requisites in mind is also a breach of the monastic rules. Question mark. But this reasoning is not correct. A monk is allowed to take medicine only for medicinal pur medicinal purposes. If he takes that same medicine for a nu nutritional purpose, then it is an improper act according to the following monastic rule. So, for example, honey. Could be seen as a medicinal, or could be seen as having medicinal uh, uses, right? Or ni. If a pikku eats for nutritional purpose the food allowed after noon, yama kalika, 
the food allowed for a week. Satta Hakka Satta Hakkalika and the food allowed for life. Yawa Jiwika. It is an improper act every time he swallows it. So if he if he eats um, allowed food after noon. is improper act. So I think the Buddha said something like uh, for some uh, monk who is pretending to be a monk but uh, has no intention of becoming enlightened and he just lives of the generosity of the people it's better for him to swallow a red hot iron ball than to actually eat any of the food from the people of faith who donates out of faith and with uh, pure intention because it would then be like stealing it's like you're stealing from the Sangha actually Anyway, so it is clear that this offense is due to the violation of the monastic precept, but it is not a violation of keeping in mind the purpose for using the medicine. For this reason, the subcommentary says that it is possible to purify a failure to keep in mind the purpose for using the four requisites by considering the purpose of the requisites used during the day, sometime before the next dawn. So this is about eating and mindfully eating. For example, if you eat too much, not just to stay alive and be able to study and practice, then you are again eating for reasons beyond what the Buddha prescribed. And also, it is not healthy to be overweight, for example, which is going to be a hindrance to um, um, having a pure mind, you know, if you're corrupting your own body um and you're you don't really care about uh the purpose of why you're taking in food so you're allowing yourself to just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and you never never stop eating and you're kind of just gratifying yourself you know um so yeah obviously if in the same breath, if you're going to be meditating, um, like your monastery, you might eat less than, for example, if you're going to be going on a long hike, if you're going to go to another monastery, it might be a good thing to keep in mind that you're going to have to spend much, much more energy than you're used to. So even though your body might not be able to, you, you when you're full, because you you only eat maybe a little little bit, then you're full. You might think that it would be beneficial to eat more, because your body is going to need that, and you don't know when you're going to get your meal, the next meal. So that would be kind of a uh, wise consideration as to um, traveling, because if you're traveling, you know you're walking from one monastery to the next monastery, and you're to maybe you're going to sleep out and it could get cold you could get sick from not having energy or food and uh, to restore the body during the the travel so that's that's um, 
a note on when to eat and when not to eat. Okay. Venerable Tipitaka Chulanka Chulanaka Tera. What number was that? 26. A Tera is one who has been ordained bhikkhu for at least 10 years. Was a highly respected senior monk. He was a senior even to Venerable Buddha Gosa, the author of the commentaries. He was well versed in the Tipitaka, the three baskets of the Buddhist scriptures. So let's see the three baskets there. Are there. Vinaya. The suttas, the Vinaya. Uh, the sutta is the discourses, the Vinaya is the monastic rules and regulations, and the Abhidhamma is the higher teachings or kind of like the Buddhist psychology or spiritual psychology. We have a visitor. A spider. Or like kind of like a it's not really a spider, it's I don't know what it's called in English. He was well versed in the Buddhist scriptures and was highly respected by the authors of the commentaries, so his views would have been taken seriously. The notion that failing to consider the purpose for the four requisites as a breach of the monastic rules is contradictory to the venerable Tipitaka Chulanaka Tera's view. According to him, only the observation of the monastic precepts is morality. The other three classes of morality are not described as mor morality in any Pali texts. Contrary to some other teachings, he explained that restraining the senses is simply restraint of the six senses. Pursuing a pure livelihood is simply obtaining the four requisites in a fair and honest manner and wisely using requisites is simply reflecting on the purpose of using the four requisites obtained fairly. And we can also read that in Pali, but it's not really it's the Buddha, as far as I know. So yeah, reflecting on the purpose of using the four requisites obtained fairly. Since if you get too much food, and if the monk gets too much food in his alms bowl, he has to throw away and discard that which he cannot eat, or he could give it to other people, maybe beggars or other monks who, for some reason, don't get uh, as much food a as he does, something like that. Um, but many times, even the Buddha would discard his food and put. Uh, put it in the earth so no one w would eat it since if someone were to eat something that was had been given to the Buddha stealing from the Buddha you know there would be no end to their suffering so it is out not out of stinginess that the Buddha would do so it is out of compassion that he would make sure that this would not befall another being to become a robber or a thief. But even being a thief of the Sangha, for example, stealing out of the trash the Sangha, uh, it's a source for unending suffering. Only observing the monastic precepts constitute authentic morality. If a monk breaks his morality, he could be compared to a man whose head has been cut off. It is useless for him to consider lesser injuries to his limbs, the other three classes of morality. If a monk keeps this morality robust, he is compared to a man with a healthy head, who can therefore protect his life and limbs. So according to this senior monk, as long as a monk's observation of the monastic rules is in good condition, 
the other three moral moralities can be restored, however damaged they may be. Of course, there's no doubt that a perfectly restored and purified morality keeps a monk to realize path and fruition. According to other teachers, obviously when you're not enlightened and you haven't, under, haven't seen the truth, Nibbana, then anything you do is of extreme and immediate danger to you since it has an imprint on your mind. So if you're already enlightened, um, you cannot fall away, you know. You cannot fall away from, you can't become enlightened and then become unenlightened. But if you're not enlightened, you can uh, foolishly do something which will cause an incredible hindrance on your path to becoming enlightened. Like, like for example, the example of the ma louse on the rope. You know, it is, and that's why even just for maybe an unenlightened monk, if he thinks to himself, I have uh, done something wrong, then when he thinks to himself, I have done something wrong, th that mind state of worry and stress and ultimately suffering is actually unwholesome. So when he thinks about it and when he is reminded about it, maybe he thinks, um, when I ate too much or when I ate and I forgot uh, the purpose of eating during the night I really forgot to do it and that was a lack of um, uh, it was a lack of um, you know considering the purpose of using the requisite of food and so when he kind of lacks in his practice and becomes too lax that is going to create suffering in his mind for it could take months or years for such a monk if he is not guided and helped to overcome this uh, minor um, fault he had made and that's why it is so important for samaneras and unenlightened bhikkhus to adhere to the rules and be you know very strict but even if the strictest of monks is not guaranteed to become enlightened due to his ability to keep all the monastic rules because no one can become enlightened due to rules they are only as I said like a fence that keeps you from doing things which is going to cause you to n not be able to become enlightened like for example if you indebt yourself or if you do something before you become a monk that uh, makes it so that you owe prison time for example um, and so you can't become a monk not to say you cannot become enlightened if you're not a monk but in most cases that's very rare but these are things that are going to keep you from enlightenment and that's why it is beneficial and helpful to have these rules. But to worry and stress about all of these rules and not focus on what is actually important, which is the quality of mind from a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So if you're alway, always stressing about, oh, I'm eating something and I'm worrying about if I'm doing right. Or maybe you're walking and you're, you just kind of look up and you see something which you shouldn't be looking at and then you think to yourself oh no I have done something wrong I looked at something I shouldn't be looking at so that mind state of worrying and regretting and remorsing over past deeds that is actually an unwholesome mind state which is going to further create more suffering seeing through an Abhidhamma perspective here so if such a monk who was so worried were to be told this by a senior monk that you know perpetuating this mind state of unwholesome worry because there is worry uh, hiri and what is it otapa and hiri right those are wholesome uh, states of uh, dr you know dreading 
to do something wrong that is a wholesome state and being shameful about having done something wrong that is also wholesome but inducing stress and suffering on account of worry itself um, and perpetuating these worrying states that is going to make it impossible to meditate and ultimately impossible to gain the right path and right fruition because it is veering from what is right the right path and the fruition of the right path so in the case of worrying about these rules one should note to oneself that worry has arisen in the mind and a vipassana technique is here as applied as follows one would say to oneself worried worried or worrying worrying until one sees the worrying fade and disappear from one's mind um, another example could be for example if you were to step on an ant or if you were to sit on a little creeper and you fer you would because you hadn't really been mindful about uh, where you were going to sit so you just sat down wherever and when you stood up you found out that you had maybe sat on a frog or something then you would be reminded oh I didn't check where I was going to see to sit and that would cause you to think about having kind of not guarded your own body and actually killed unintentionally so here you have an unintentional killing which is not actually breaking the precept but it is still being guilty of um, you know not keeping a mindful guard on the body so in that case one would might feel remorse and shame from not being able to guard oneself from killing uh, I mean you're killing beings or for example you're walking and you're you're looking before you and there's nothing and you're just about to place your step and as you're placing your foot something jumps in under your foot and then you step on it and you just see it but you can't it's too late for you to, to actually stop because it is in the last moment of your step and then you might think to yourself oh I, I have killed something and yeah you have actually unintentionally killed something so if you're able to cut through that with discernment seeing your own intention that would be possible at that point to actually remove all of the unwholesome worry and the unwholesome mind states seeing that in no way did you intentionally kill something you could also say that whatever jumped under your foot would, was pretty stupid not to look up and see the big foot being placed right there so it could also be the kamma of the uh, little creeper whatever it was maybe it was a frog to be squashed for a billion lifetimes you know you never know unless you are a buddha the kamma of beings so this is just a comment on what actually uh, constitutes morality in regard to mental states so I would say that you know it is a good point that this elder makes here And of course, someone who. But this is kind of different because it kind of hints at someone who is intentionally breaking uh, the precepts of uh, misusing the requisites. You know, as soon as you get into something where you're stealing and you don't care, that is uh, that's worse than un unintentionally killing something. Or maybe you sit down and you sat on something if you every day every day you just eat and you don't really care 
that you're possibly stealing from the Sangha, you know, if you're able to get over that yourself, then you could become enlightened. But it would, you know, it could be very, 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 very hard to forgive yourself from, you know, what are you doing? You're kind of uh, stealing and ultimately abusing the faithful people who uh, donate to the Sangha. So that's kind of like violence, right? So, I mean, it, it could actually do more harm to yourself, uh, even though it might not be such a big deal. It, it, because of what uh, kind of an imprint it leaves on your mind. Here we have a dog. Come on, baby eyes. Come on. So here we have a dog. Oh, she's, she's a baby dog. So I think we're just going to take uh, a few m moments uh, break here. We have been live for one and a half hours. We're going to take five minutes. And then we're going to... Shh, ice baby. And we're going to continue. But I think I'm just going to read until the next uh, paragraph here starts. So, I think that was a good note to actually add that, um, since it is uh, related to the Abhidhamma of uh, the Dhamma, Buddha Dhamma. And it's also very important for meditators, you know. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it is extremely important, uh, as I just said, uh, for the reasons that I just mentioned. Okay, here. According to other teachers, path and fruition cannot be attained when one uses requisites on loan, and a one-time failure to keep in mind the purpose for using requisites cannot be purified. These opinions contradict the above-mentioned Theravada doctrine. So it all really depends on how much of an imprint the uh, breaking of the precept has made on the, the on the yogi practicing for enlightenment because as i said it all it really varies uh, as i said but i i mean i'm i'm with the theravada doctrine here it is possible to overcome your own remorse and your own regret of negligence, because only an arahant is free from negligence, you know, uh, ignorance, avidya. So we have to be able to forgive ourselves for essentially not being enlightened. And this is very possible to do so, you know. Even if someone has killed some beings, maybe humans, it is still possible to become enlightened. So just keep that in mind, you know. Someone could kill human beings, and then come to meet with the Dhamma and then realize the truth and then see their own evil deeds and evil views of having been able to do certain things and then they would regret it and feel remorse um, but if they come to, to gain right view they would not have unwholesome remorse they would have shame uh, and dread of having done this in the past, in this life, for example. Because all of us has done th something bad in this life and in previous lives. And that is also going to leave its mark in our lives, in this life, and in future lives, possibly. Not always, but possibly it will. So... There are no uh, black and white things like if you do this, then this can never happen. The only instance is if you kill your parents, mother and father, there's no way you're going to become enlightened because your mind is going to be so scattered that every time you approach the Dhamma, you're just going to fall into misery, suffering, and there's no way you're going to avoid hell. You know, 
there's just no way. Or if you kill an Arahant, there's no way that your mind is going to be restored without having to pay the severe consequences of such actions. You know, there are some things that are just too grave. Like these two things, you know, you can't kill a fully enlightened Buddha. No one can kill a fully enlightened Buddha. But maybe you can harm a private Buddha, for example. Again, if you do that, you know, it, there's not really any coming back from that. So, be careful and guard your feet, or else they will carry you off to a destination where you cannot find your way back from. Okay, continuing on here. The method for reflecting on the purpose of the requisites is explained in the definition of moderation in eating. Bojane matan matanyo. Moderation. Bo bojane matanyo. Matanyo means moderation. Matan yutta. Understanding moderation. Truth of moderation. Anyway, found in the Abhidhamma and in the Buddhist discourses such as the Sabhasava Sutta and the Asava Sutta. Sabhasava Sutta. Asava Sutta. That is about the taints, right? 29. This is about the destruction of the taints. However, it is never directly referred to as keeping in mind the purpose for using the four requisites. Instead, it is called moderation in eating or abandoning taints by using. Patti sewana pahata ba pahata ba sawa. For this reason, the Venerable Dibhittaka Chulanaga Tera said that it is not described as morality in the Pali texts. Okay, so, yeah, you know, I also think that this is true because, you know, if you become a monk, you shouldn't worry about your, uh, everything you do. I mean, obviously, if you you step on ants and you step on frogs and you don't care and you just do it even though you know they're there you that's a big problem but if you eat maybe one spoonful too much or maybe you eat one spoonful too less then you're kind of doing yourself a disservice and then again you would be guilty because you are the most important being in the universe right no one else so it's important to also be considering your own being not as being yours but as being something to take care of with compassion and love to the extent that it is a love which is based on non-attachment kind of emulating what an an, an you know an aria an enlightened being even though you might not understand what that is you are trying to be like such a person. Okay, so a five minute break, and then we're going to get into here meditation and consideration. Carefully restraining the senses. Let me just look ahead a little bit. Yeah, this is going to be amazing, and we definitely want this in the first part as well. So we're going to stretch it to maybe two and a half hours. Um, so just a few moments and I'll be right back. And I will leave the book. I should leave it standing like this. Let me just get the page number. Page number 12, right? Isn't that the page? Yeah. So page number 12. And just a moment and we'll be right back. I'm going to let my dog out so she could be happy and also I'm going to um, let myself out so I also can be happy and um, yeah 
we'll be right back. You can meditate, and I would really appreciate it if you would meditate during this uh, small little break. Or you could also go and, you know, maybe wash up or whatever. And thank you so much for listening and paying attention so far. And we have a lot of amazing dhammas to be to go through. And so hang in there and we will be right back.
hello stream and as you can see I've just taken my shirt off because it's actually getting a, you know a little bit hot in here um, and it's kind of a little bit of a heavy, heavy book <laughs> so please uh, bear with me as I try to go through this next chapter and so Oh, I just got a huge shock. There's a spider on my cup. Now it's under my cup. Let me just let it outside to see if I can grab it. Do you want to see it? Can you see it? That was the kind of the spider thing I was talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's actually pretty funny. I kind of got a huge shock right there. Okay, so let me just go outside with this. Oh, he got out. Okay, maybe he could just walk around on my hand. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, so we're going to continue, and um, let me just make sure this sound is on, and I <laughs> drink some water. Okay, so meditation and consideration. As follows Reflecting on the purpose for using the requisites is, in an ultimate sense, wise reflection or reviewing. Pacha Vikanya Vikanga Pacha Vikana. And it more properly belongs to the field of training in wisdom. Panyasika and to the field of training in morality, silasika. Reflecting on the purpose for using the requisites is not intended as a way to legitimize requisites according to the monastic rules, as, as are the practices of resolve, adit, aditana, and assignment, wikapana. Nor should such reflection simply be recited as a mantra. Reflection is instead meant to protect the monk from the mental defilements associated with the four requisites. Like for example a robe. So, a monk should use the four requisites with proper consideration of their purpose. So what is the purpose of a robe? A robe the purpose of a robe or a shirt is to keep you warm and keep you know your body safe from insects biting you and to generally protect you from the elements. And um since we're inside here uh, in my own little cave like dwelling here I'm well protected. So you could say that this cave is actually also kind of like a robe or a dwelling. Um, yeah. Furthermore, <coughs> excuse me. Furthermore, an inside meditator automatically fulfills the practice of keeping in mind the purpose for using the four requisites, as demonstrated by the following passage. 
If a bhikkhu contemplates the requisites in terms of elements or loathsomeness, for example, loathsomeness of the body, when it sweats and when it gets dirty and such, loathsomeness, when he obtains or uses them, then there is no offense for using or keeping overdue or extra robes and so on. Excuse me. Okay, so there's a... Uh, okay, here we go. The Pali of this I just read as follows. Patila Bakalepi hi datu datu wasena wa patikula was patikula wasena wa pacha wekiti wa pacha pacha wekitwa tapi tani Chiwa Radini Tato Uttari Pari Punjan Tassa Anna Wajowa Pari Boko Pari Boka Kalepi Amazing. Get to re read these in Pali as well. This will be explained in detail later in the section on a layperson's morality. Thus, keeping in mind the purpose for using the four requisites can be completely purified in two ways. Either by means of considering the purpose for using the requisites or through meditation on any object. Any object. Carefully restraining the senses. Restraining the senses means to carefully restrain the senses in order to prevent the arising of defilements. When one of the six types of sense objects enters one of the six sense doors and arouses one of the six sense consciousness, says consciousnesses. I will only give a detailed explanation of how to restrain oneself in order to have this kind of pure morality with regard to the eye sense door. One can understand the other sense doors in a similar manner. So that would be the maybe you smell something very nice or maybe it's disgusting and you actually also have to guard against it or you hear something very beautiful or you taste something very very delicious food maybe like some cake or something or even pleasant thoughts you know or feelings um, those are the sense doors on seeing a form with the eye he does not grasp at its sign and features When seeing a form with the eye, a monk should not recognize a person by his or her male or female form or by physical gestures and facial expressions. As the commentary says, let seeing be just seeing. The sub-commentary explains that one should not allow one's mind to wander beyond the mere fact of seeing by paying attention to how beautiful or ugly a person is, and so forth. The mental defilements of craving and so, f and so on often result from paying close attention to the face and limbs of the opposite sex. So, one should not take an active interest in the body parts of a person of the opposite sex, the face, the eyes, the eyebrows, the nose, lips, the breasts, the chest, the arms, legs, and so on. Similarly, one should not take an active interest in his or her gestures, the way he, where he or she smiles, 
laughs, talks, pouts, casts a, a side glance, and so on. As the commentary says, he only apprehends what is really there. So that would be seeing, seeing, seeing. It's just seeing, you know. Yang Tata Yang Tata Bhutang Tatiwi Gantati He only apprehends what is really there. According to this quote, one should pay attention only to what really exists in the person who is seen. What really exists is that the person that person is hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, tendons, bones, and so on. Alter so even, you know, even going so far as, th you know, when you see a body and then you think, oh, it's just a collection of all of these things, that is actually, uh, you know, not really existing because when you think about all of you know bones and nails and teeth and sinews that is kind of a, you know a concentration meditation where you focus on objects which are separate from direct experience whereas the direct experience when you look at something or a body for example of the opposite sex is it just an experience of seeing and anything beyond that you know what are you seeing that is uh, going in a very very strict way of speaking that is that's going too far so it doesn't really matter what you look at uh, as long as you can kind of bring your mind back to the fact of an experience of seeing and maybe you're thinking about what you're seeing so you could say to yourself thinking thinking or liking liking or maybe you you don't like what you see and then you say disliking disliking noting the dislike arising in the mind so it you know no one can really hurt another being even if they kill uh even if someone kills you you know they they didn't really hurt you as long as i mean obviously if someone kills someone who is not enlightened they have uh, seriously hindered their uh, chance of realizing the Dhamma in this life. So in that regard, obviously taking a life is wrong. But for someone who is enlightened, who has attained the deathless state, where there is, uh, you know, for an Arahant, and this is not to say to kill a, an Arahant at all, I'm just saying that you can't really hurt an arhant since um, there's not really anyone to hurt. It's just uh, yeah, it, it really is uh, only yourself you're hurting in such a case. So it doesn't re really matter what you look at. You know, oftentimes the Buddha would use like uh, use a skull of a dead person and the bone, the skull, of a dead person as his uh, sleeping pillow to, um, to really, you know, get, to get a chance at um, practicing meditations which are frightening or terrifying or upsetting to the mind it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, meditation object you use as long as your mindfulness is perfect and you're not carried away obviously if you're carried away by beautiful sights women or if you're a woman uh, men if y if you're just carried away and you you're not kind of dancing with your meditation practice as in bringing your mind back continuously bringing your mind back to the experience of seeing which is a, a like a beautiful thing since you're practicing rightly so 
that is um, the way leading to enlightenment and you know you can't just kind of close your eyes off and expect to become enlightened you have to be able to face anything even death you know if you're really intent on becoming enlightened so keeping that in mind obviously it is good for lustful persons to kind of restrain their um sense uh or their their um you know they take away the ability of uh things that could might possibly overcome them take the ability of that away by avoiding them and removing them but in the long run you should be able to overcome anything and nothing should be able to overcome you what's going on here let me just fix this cable thing here it's spun up Okay. He only apprehends what is really there. Direct experience. According to this quote, one should pay attention only to what exists in the person who is seen. Uh, okay, we already read this. Alternately, one should... What did I just do here? Alternately, one should observe the four primary material elements and the secondary derived material elements in the person. And we have a footnote, number 34. Okay, this is just a reference. I will now explain how restraint arises in accordance with the commentary. When a visible form stimulates the eye door, the sequence of mind moments occurs as follows. One attends to the object, awajana, awajana, eye consciousness, chakku vinyana, sees the object, receives the object, sampati, sampati chana, investigates the object santirana determines the object vottapana and fully receives the object or moves towards it jawana restraint may arise at the moment of full perception by means of morality sila mindfulness sati knowledge jnana forbearance, kanti, or effort, virya. If any of these forms of restraint arises, the morality of restraining the senses is fulfilled. Alternately, alternately, self-indulgence may arise due to immorality, mindlessness, ignorance, impatience, or idleness. Indulgence. These five states constitute the quality of lacking restraint. Asamvaratamma. Immorality, mindlessness, ignorance, impatience and or idleness. Restraint by means of morality. Restraint by means of morality is called sila samvara. In Pali, according to the commentary, it refers to the observation of monastic precepts. Uh, vi a violation of this kind of restraint is called self-indulgence through immoral conduct. Dusilya. Dusilya. Dusilya asamvara. Breaking the monastic precepts either verbally or bodily 
is a breach of the monastic code. With regard to self-indulgence via immorality, the sub-commentaries say that a transgression does not happen at the five sin stores with the arising, with the arising of a transgression, transgressive defilement, which he alone. The transgression only happens at the mind door. Transgressions via the remaining four self-indulgent behaviors arise at all six sense doors. Restraint by mindfulness is called Sati Samvara in Pali. Restraint by means of mindfulness refers to restraint of the senses, restraint of the eye, Chakku Samvara, and so on. This is true restraint of the senses. In an ultimate sense, it is mindfulness that restrains the six sense doors in order to prevent the arising of defilements. On the other hand, Forgetting to be mindful will lead to self-indulgence. Mut Muttasatya asamvara that manifests as covetousness, apicca, and aversion, as described by the following Pali passage. Yeah, so it it really doesn't matter what you're, let's say, what you're looking at, or let's say you're outside and you go buy some flowers. And they smell really nice. Or maybe you, when you're in a forest, every time you're in a forest, you just like all the smells. You know, the smells of the or the scents of the earth and the scents of the trees and you, the wind. You can feel it on your skin and you just like it all. So you could say, that you know, every time you go outside, you just like to be outside. That's not really a problem. The problem is with the liking of it. So whatever you experience is is not actually um, the problem. The problem is the mind, which kind of uh, you know goes a step further than just experiencing, you know, sense, smell something, you some very nice flowers, or you maybe go by a field of flowers or whatever it could be. You know, that's not the problem. The problem is. Uh, the lack of mindfulness so when you smell something nice for example in the forest you can just say to yourself oh smelling or you know smelling has, a, has arisen as an experience as, or as a phenomena so you say to say to yourself in accordance with the meditation practice of vipassana you say to yourself smelling 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 and then smelling will be just that it's just an experience of smelling or seeing maybe you like to look at trees you know and you think they're they're just so beautiful and you they just make you so happy and jubilant or something you know like for example this painting here i have on the wall of an olive tree i kind of you know enjoy it and it makes me happy so that is something i add to the experience of just seeing because really there is no tree it's just some paint on paint on a wall right but in my mind, I create that I'm looking at an olive tree, a little olive tree. So that is when the uh, mindfulness aspect actually uh, has a chance to interfere with the, d the experience of just seeing. So I remind myself, oh, it's just a wall, it's just a painting. And really what is going on is just it's just an experience of seeing and then maybe i remember back to s some time where i was 
here in Denmark we don't have olive trees so maybe I, once I was in a country where they do have olive trees and I remember back to that and then I remember all these beautiful sm smells and sights and that's also me just remembering so I say to myself remembering remembering or liking liking and so forth and then I stop the um, possibility of falling into immorality by reminding me of what is really there. So that is uh, uh, how the guard of mindfulness works. Okay, and diversion, as described by the following Pali passage, greed and sorrow, evil, unskillful states, would overwhelm him if he dwelt, leaving his eye faculty unguarded. Yeah, so you can't really... Uh, number 38. Chakuntri Chakutriyang Asam Wutang Viharang Tang Apicha Yumanasa Papaka Akusala Tamma Anwasa Weyung Anwasa Weyung Greed and sorrow, evil unskillful un evil unskilled states would overwhelm him if he dwelt leaving his eye faculty unguarded. So remember back to the the Bhikkhu, the monk who was born as a louse. He liked his robe so much he was born as a louse on the robe. So even if you're like in a prison cell, but you like your own clothing, you know, you have to apply mindfulness to this liking of your robes. So it doesn't really matter what kind of object it is, you know, some people are you know, some people are attracted to this and that, or this, and some people are attracted to that, and some people are actually attracted to something that other people th uh, would, would think of with disgust. So, it doesn't really make sense, you know, because there's no real, oh, everyone just likes this, you know. And not uh, Sometimes the, the text use uh, an example of, uh, you know, you know, feces. Every all human beings don't like feces, but for worms and beetles, they uh, see feces as, as a f you know, a source of food. So, you know, <laughs> you have to really be careful about uh, taking this mindfulness of all uh, phenomena that arises in your mind. Just remind yourself what it is. You know. So apparently some people, as well, some human people, they don't really mind feces, apparently. It seems to be like that in some cases, you know. But for most people it is disgusting. Restraint by means of wisdom. Restraint by means of wisdom is called jnana samvera in Pali. According to such texts as the chula ni Nidesa, Jula Nidesa, and the Sutta Nipata commentary, restraint by wis by means of wisdom occurs with the attainment of the path knowledges. Makanyana. The wisdom of path knowledge that restrains the current of unwholesomeness, such as craving, wrong view, defilements, misbehavior, ignorance, and so on is called restraint by means of wisdom. Footnote, uh, number, oh, I just closed it. Number 39. Sotanang Samwarang Rumi Panyayete Pitti Pitti 
Yareti Ayang Nyana Samwaro And we're back. According to the Visudimaka, restraint by means of wisdom also Restraint by means of wisdom also arises with keeping in mind the purpose for using the four requisites. Restraint by wisdom Restraint by means of wisdom is this. And use of the requisites here is combined with this. A little bit. Okay. From the path of purification. The Visudimaka. Inside knowledge should also be included in restraint by means of wisdom. The practice of insight meditation that can abandon the defilements lying dormant in sense objects. Arama, Aramanya Nus, Anusaya. Aramanya, Aramang Anusaya. defilements lying dormant in sense objects so for example as i was talking about with the forest or the, s the scent of, s of flowers maybe you don't uh, s smell nice flowers every day but then you go out oh sh uh, there they are the nice scent of flowers and then you smell them what you're going to do it's a dormant defilement in the scent of flowers so inside knowledge should also be included here as the practice of inside meditation reminding yourself that it is an experience of smelling, then you are directing your mind to direct experience. The, the Paramatta Dhamma, the ultimate reality of an experience. And then it, it's just going to be smelling, 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 nice flowers. And nothing beyond that. Aramang. Araman Anusaya A practice of inside meditation that can abandon the development like dormant sense objects. Aramang Arama Aramanang Arama Aramang Anusaya by means of partial removal. Tadang gapapa na. Tadang gapapa na. Is even better than restraining defilements by means of reflection. Yeah. The Nidesa states Perceiving and seeing all. Perceiving and seeing that all conditioned things are impermanent, one restrains the current of defilements through wisdom. Sape Sankare Anicca Tichanato Passato Panya Yeti Sutta Pitbianti Perceiving and seeing that all conditioned things are impermanent, one restrains the current of defilements through wisdom. So that's what we just read means that even better than reminding yourself of, uh, you know, the bones and nails and teeth and the sinews of maybe a beautiful woman, even better than that uh, guard of mindfulness is to remind yourself of the ultimate experience which is just seeing and then liking if you like it what you see excuse me then you remind yourself that liking has arisen in your mind which is a hindrance linked to desire thus path knowledge keeping in mind the purpose for using the four requisites and insight knowledge are all considered part of restraint by means of wisdom Non-restraint is the opposite of these three kinds of wisdom, namely delusion, moha. So when you give yourself to the object, you know, when you let it overwhelm you, 
and you really start to think about them how oh it would be so nice if I could have this and if it could be mine or you know when you just take it all in without restraining yourself and without reminding yourself of what is really going on in yourself you know that you are seeing some things and they are affecting you in a way that uh, makes liking and desire maybe arise in you so if you're just neglecting all of those experience experiences if you're neglecting all of those then you're not focusing on what is ultimately real and then you're lost to illusion moha delusion restraint by means of forbearance Restraint by means of forbearance is called Kantisamvara in Pali. This refers to exercising patience in dealing with cold, heat, severe pain, insults, very harsh words, and so on. It is, in an ultimate sense, non-aversion or non-hatred, adosa. Its opposite is self-indulgence due to impatience, akanti asamvara. Restraint by means of effort is called Virya Samvara in Pali. Effort refers to exerting energy in order to abandon the thoughts of sensual pleasure and so on. In an ultimate sense, it is the effort that is the right kind of striving. Samapadana Virya Made according to the following Pali passage. Here, Abhiku awakens Seo for the non arising of unarisen evil, unwholesome states. And he makes effort, arousing energy, exerts his mind, and strives. We should really read the Pali for that. Anupanang. Pappakanang, Akusalanang, Dhamma Nang, Anupadaya, Chandang Janeti Vayamati. According to the Visuddhimagga, the morality of pursuing a pure livelihood is included in as part of restraint by means of effort. The opposite of restraint by means of effort is self indulgence through idleness or laziness when you're just so lazy that you never guard your mind and you let sense objects carry you away and take you wherever you know you could end up wherever from mo one moment you're here and the next moment you're a completely different place because and you don't know what happened you just suddenly find yourself how did I get to this point and then you're there and then you have to deal with it that is laziness as when you do not guard your feet and even you know the feet of your mind when you don't pay attention to what is going on in your mind your mind will just wander off with you carry you wherever practicing restraint prior to the practice of meditation of these five kinds of restraint two cannot be included in the preliminary practice of restraint of the senses. Restraint by means of morality falls within the domain of the morality of observing monastic precepts. Restraint by means of wisdom, however, depends on having first developed insight and path knowledges, so it cannot be observed before taking up meditation. In order to purify morality by means of carefully restraining the senses prior to the practice of meditation, one must cultivate three types of restraint. Restraint by means of mindfulness, restraint by means of forbearance, and restraint by means of effort. The way in which to apply these restraint to, purity, to purify this kind of morality is explained in the commentary called 
Atta Salini. One, one can rouse wholesomeness by means of self-control, by means of transforming one's thoughts, by means of keeping busy doing good, and by means of steering one's mind towards wholesomeness. Tassa iman imina niya mitta vasena parina mitta vasana samudacca ra vasana apuccitta vasana cha kusalang nama chattang bodhi chattang hoti Exerting self-control One should exert self-control, think, talk, and act only in wholesome ways. Let only wholesomeness come in through one's six doors. Take extra care to arouse only wholesomeness, bear patiently with whatever may happen, and make great effort not to entertain unwholesome thoughts. With this kind of self-control, one rarely thinks of anything unwholesome. When that happens, one does not allow unwholesomeness to be aroused within. One tries to think of, think in a wholesome way. So here it could be, if you see something desirable to you, you bring your mind back to the experience of just seeing or just liking the object of your uh, desire if you let liking arise which is pretty sure it's going to arise upon seeing something you desire but if you just cut it off at the experience of this is just seeing then no liking possibly no liking will arise one tries <coughs> one tries to think in a wholesome way so this which if if you do this, this is not actually in a wholesome way. That is kind of like in a, you know, a divine way of guarding your own mind and making it beautiful and pure. For example, if a generous person obtains something precious and valuable, his first thought is to offer it to someone else rather than to use it for his own pleasure. In a similar way, Self-control allows one to patiently bear anything unpleasant without reacting in an unwholesome way. This is a brief explanation of how to purify one's morality by means of restraining the senses by exerting self-control. transforming thoughts if unwholesome thoughts arise they should be transformed into wholesome thoughts for example if defiled thoughts arise when seeing a woman they might th be transformed in the following ways okay so here we go we Reg regard her as your own sister or mother depending on her age and reflect on her suffering, thereby arousing genuine thoughts of sympathy or kindness. That is one way. And next, contemplate the disgusting substances in her body, tears, saliva, muscles, phlegm, thesis, urine, and so on, by means of the perception of loathsomeness. So again, one might not actually be able to see the loathsomeness of tears, saliva, muscles, phlegm, and urine, and so forth, if one has become infatuated with, uh, for example, a woman, or the body, in this case, of a woman. And again, I would point out that before actually even perceiving, oh, look, there is a body of a woman, you should remind yourself that it is an experience of seeing, because as you do so, you know, the whole woman and her body disappears from your perception and you only really recognize there is an experience of seeing. So this way I'm, I just described is, you know, far superior to both of these ways. Uh, you know, 
and also if you start thinking about your as your sister or your mother you know it could lead to different kinds of immoral thoughts abandoned defiled thoughts continuing on abandoned defiled thoughts concerning the woman and subst substitute substitute wholesome thoughts for them by discussing and teaching the dhamma reading books the scriptures chanting or doing volunteer work and so on there are many ways to transform one's thoughts mentioned in the commentary on the satipatthana sutta this is just a brief explanation so these are good ways to kind of restrain your own thoughts but if you really want to cut off the oppot opportunity of unwholesome thoughts arising at the sight of a beautiful woman then you should remind yourself that it is just an experience of seeing, smelling, hopefully not tasting or feeling, uh, you know there's no real problem with any of these experiences of feeling, seeing, smelling or tasting as long as they're just that, you know there, yeah Okay, so I think we should end this uh, first s uh, episode in this series of the Manual of Inside Hair, and then we can continue next time with um, this next part here titled Keeping Busy Doing Good. So that's what we want to be. We want to be busy, but not really. We don't want to be busy, since a busy mind is an unwholesome mind. But it could possibly be that, you know, if you keep yourself busy doing good, you won't have time for do <laughs> for doing bad, right? But we don't want to be busy, on a serious note. But we want to do some good, at least, you know. It's And, yeah, you know, doing good is not really a way to escape samsara. Only by becoming enlightened can you really escape samsara. So, but we're going to get into all of that next time, as I think we have gone on for two and a half hours right now. And that should be enough for our first episode, even though we might have the energy to continue on for maybe two and a half hours more. But I think for the purpose of creating uh, edible episodes, not making them too long is a pretty good idea. So let me just think about what I could use as a bookmark. I think I might just snap, snatch one of these bookmarks here. Oh, look, that's my original bookmark. Where is this? Mahanidana Sutta, the great discourse on origination. Oh, and look, there's a picture with it because it's the Deacon guy. So this is where I left off. There you could see a beautiful picture. And now let me show you my the Mahanidana Sutta. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this bookmark and then we're going to take our footnote bookmark, put it in here so we don't forget where we left off. Like so. And this is the Deegan Nikaya. Translated by Maurice Walsh. And here, this is my homemade bookmark. And as you can see, it is two S's and then some secret poly. And if you do like this, uh, I'm not sure you can actually see it. No, you can't see it. Because, you know, there's no light on the background here. So, I wonder if I do like this, would you be able to see it? if I do like this. But the point here is, when you fold this thing up, it be, no, you still can't see it. If you want to see what this means, go to my website and check it out. There's a whole post about my little bookmark here. So the point is just like, you know, there's two S's and when you do this, then you can actually see through it. See through it. And then it becomes like an infinity loop, right? 
however that looks. So that's uh, my bookmark. An interesting little thing there. But yeah, you should definitely check out my website. I should make sure to put a link to it below uh, this video where I will also be uploading this episode too. And thank you so much for watching. I will try to not make the outro too long and just keep it simple and concise. And make sure you check back for the next episode where we will be further studying the practice of vipassana meditation so we can all become enlightened in this very life as taught by the Buddha and presented by the Venerable Mahasi Sayada and um, made into a video format by me uh, my name is Simon and I am very thankful for your attention and may all beings find true and lasting happiness and freedom from all suffering hereby. Thank you. Namo Buddhasa. Homage to the Blessed One. Okay. And let's just wait for a little bit because sometimes when I stop the stream, it kind of cuts off... Uh, few minutes so I just want to make sure that I actually get the last few moments that we just read before I end the stream so let me just dedicate the merit of this study session to all of those who come to view it either now or in the future and to all of those who wishes to view it but unfortunately we're unable to for some reason may they also take part in the merit of studying the Dhamma and practicing the Dhamma and finally may all beings in existence take part as we share the and as we share the merit of our study and practice of this first episode of the series of the Manual on Insight by the Venerable Mahasi Sayada to all beings in existence. Sado. And now of course I have to wait so I we make sure that the dedication of merits also is not caught of the back end of this episode and I think we're just about ready to stop the stream now so peace to all and be well until next time and remember to subscribe and like and check out the links below this video for more awesome Dhamma study and Pali study related to your meditation practice <laughs>